Hi, welcome to Fine Scale Modeler Weekly. We've got a great show for you today. I'll be back later on to mess around with some tools, and then Aaron and I will pull a subject out of a hat and discuss it with you. But first, we've got some new products to show you guys. Here's a newly tooled 172nd scale A6A intruder from Trumpeter. It appears this is the first in a series of A6 family kits coming from Trumpeter. That's right. It also introduced a 132nd scale intruder a decade ago. Surface detail on the fuselage includes recessed panel lines and rivets along with a few raised panels. The separate radome is a single part and the wings, which can be modeled folded or deployed, feature posable flaps and slats. Other features include the fuselage air brakes, often disabled and later removed entirely, and the split wingtip air brakes, intake trunks with front fans, short jet pipes, and the insert for the tail hook. The two-place cockpit has a molded throttle quadrant and detailed rear wall and turtle deck, ejection seats with separate cushions and D-handles, instrument panel that gets decal displays, and shroud. All of that should be visible under the thin clear canopy that can be posed open. Pre-cut masks are supplied. Underneath are detailed landing gear legs and bays. Like any good attack aircraft, the intruder looks right with ordnance hanging from it and the kit supplies a bunch, including centerline and underwing fuel tanks, GBU-8s, M117s, and a pair of multiple ejector racks that can carry up to six Mark 81 or Mark 82 bombs. Mark 20 rock eyes are also provided. The decal sheet supplies stencils for the weapons and airframe, as well as markings for two intruders. One from VA-196 aboard USS Constellation off Vietnam in 1968 and early 1969, and an A-6A with VA-145 aboard USS Ranger off Vietnam in 1972 and 73. This kit looks good in the box, and it'll be interesting to see what it looks like when built. Yeah, now uh, former FSM senior editor Paul Boyer, he's really looking forward to building this for review, so we should know real soon how it looks when it's built. So when Doom Part 1 was released in 2021, I really liked how the Spice Collector and the Ornithopters looked in the movie. I thought the designs were dead on for what was described in, uh, in the novels. So I'm guessing that means you were excited when you heard about these model kits coming out. Uh, I actually, it was one of those things where it was like, yeah, they've got to make, they've got to make models of, of these, of these vehicles because it just, to me, it made sense. Now I'm, I'm a little disappointed that they aren't bigger, but hey, this is a first step toward maybe, I don't know, something more. Let's start with the Ornithopters. We have the smaller Atreides version and slightly larger Harkonnen craft. The kits share several parts, including the blade wings and the landing gear, blade attachments, and lights. The gear parts can be traded out on the models to show it in flight or on the ground. A stand is included, and the blades can be rotated and folded backwards for the grounded version. The differences appear in the fuselage sections. The thinner Atreides machine has the front, a split thorax with the attachments for the eight blades, and the long, thin tail. Surface detail is fine at the scale, and no clear parts are provided. Instead, decals supply the windows as well as the House Atreides crest. The bulkier Harkonnen craft is split the same way, with the nose, thorax with attachments for six wings, a shorter tail and nose weapon. Decals supply the windows and the House Harkonnen symbol. The third kit is bigger, but so is the subject, one of the massive spice harvesters from Arrakis. Surface detail on the hull looks good, with the bridge and rear sand exhausts well represented. The spice gatherers and the sides of the many bogies that the tracks fit around finish the mining vehicle. A small decal sheet has a couple of markings. With the imminent release of Dune Part 2, these kits are well-timed. And I really hope they sell well for Meng, because I would love for Meng to bring out like 172nd scale or 148th scale versions of these ornithopters. That would be so cool. Italy area has been the go-to for big rigs, especially European tracks. The latest is this 124th scale MAN 26231 Formel 6, a tooling that originated in the early 1980s. Typical of Italy's trucks, the cab, molded in white, builds from a separate front, side, top, and rear panels. The front wheel wells and aerodynamic roof fairing are here too. The bumper is molded in black. 
Inside, there are parts for the roof liner, door and wall panels, seat and bunks for the sleeper cab, and the dash and controls. The frame builds from separate side rails and cross members. It gets fitted with the axles, suspension, fuel tanks, and brakes that attach to the multi-part wheels, including chrome-plated outer parts. Other plated items include the radiator surrounds, steps, mirror brackets, horns, and exhausts. Under the cab sits a nicely detailed engine with block and transmission, head, oil pan, hoses, and manifolds, and radiator. Each of the windows is a separate part. The clear tree also supplies lights and the visor for the windshield. Cartograph decals supply stripes for the cab, mirrors, badgings, instrument cluster, and license plates for the Netherlands, France, Austria, Denmark, the UK, Germany, Spain, Italy, Sweden, and New South Wales, Australia. This is yet another awesome truck from Italy. Do you like small German armor? If you do, here's the Hobby Boss 172nd scale Panzer 38T Ausif EF. It wasn't an especially big vehicle to begin with, so the hull is barely more than two inches long. The suspension is molded in place, as are petite rivets, rear hull details, and even spare tracks on the front. The tracks and wheels are molded together, and all you need to add are the inner halves of the drive sprockets and the idlers. The upper hull features separate fenders with some of the tools molded on. Two main guns are included in case you break this important part putting it into the turret. The commander's cupola is separate. The decals don't scrimp on marking options with six provided, including overall gray tanks, one from the 25th Panzer Regiment in Russia in 1942, the other with the 204th in Crimea in 1941 and 42. Two more vehicles from the 204th in Crimea one in gray and dark yellow, the other overall gray, a 19th Panzer Division Panzer 38 with worn winter whitewash, and an overall gray 10th Panzer Regiment tank, both in Russia. It may not be very big or have very many parts, but there's a lot of really good detail for the scale. Look for a review of it, the A6, and the man on finescale.com. Our website is the place to go for hundreds. Nay, thousands of reviews as well as galleries, how-to stories, videos, snapshots, and so much more. That's right. And while you're there, hit up Kalmbach Hobby Store where you can get gifts, books, tools, puzzles, and even calendars. Fine Scale Modeler Weekly is brought to you by HobbyZone USA, your source for hobby storage solutions, hard to find hobby tools, and aftermarket modeling needs and by Cult TV Man's Hobby Shop, your place to go for science fiction and fantasy kits, decals, accessories, details, and more. We were very excited to receive a sample of the, and I'm gonna get this name, I'm gonna get this name wrong. We, we're calling it the Crydrufi modular art box. It could be Crydrufi, Crid, Crid, I don't know. Anyway, we were excited to get a sample of this modular art box. Um, they were actually in contact with us early on. Um, they did a Kickstarter campaign. It was fully funded, and now they are in the process of fulfilling the Kickstarter backers' orders and then taking pre-orders on Indiegogo for the actual box itself, um, which means that any of us can go ahead and order these. And what we wanted to do is open up this art box, take a look at it, and see if it would be useful for modelers like us. So let's get into it. So it's not a big deal, really, but on our sample, obviously there was supposed to be some sort of, of grab handle here. And I'm assuming that, uh, you know, if you order it from Indiegogo, that it'll come with this grab handle. Um, but yeah, we didn't get one and I'm, I, I, f I feel as if we're not able to give you the full experience because the plastic handle wasn't here, but I think it's supposed to come with a handle. Anyway, stop shaking your head at me. Get a grip on yourself, Kidwell. <laughs> as my wife would say. <laughs> get yourself together, girl. Anyway, I just noticed that, right? No handle. Let's open the box. Inside we have 
a little box. Greatness comes from a small beginning. We believe in the power of details. That's kind of cool. And then, oh, 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 the thing itself. Put that over there. Nice. All right. Before we before we get into this, let's take a look at what's inside the little cardboard box here. I bet you what we find are some wet palette. Yep. A couple of moisturizing sponges for the uh, the wet palette. And then four in one disposable palette papers, 10 sheets each that obviously fit on those sponges. Ever since the uh, the nippers from Dispay, we always check now to make sure that the box is completely empty. That is completely empty. All right, let's set those aside and we get into the box itself. So first up, you can see that there are a number of modules here and that they are all clipped together and then they clip into this top section that has a couple of paint cups in it. So let's first just unclip the lower modules and we'll set those aside for the time being and come back to them. And then we'll take a look at this. So this is, you know, basically your art caddy. Um, I can see right here, you can see this, that there's a, uh, a space right here that you can stick your fingers through and pick this whole thing up. But let's first, we've got a couple of cups and then in each of these is a brush holder. Now this is a, this is a brush holder just for holding the brushes while this one over here is a, it holds brushes and it also has a little drip tray underneath it too. And these brush holders actually can clip on the outside of this little, this little caddy. And then the cups can fit right back inside just like that. And that works pretty nice. That's nice and compact. That's a cool design. At the bottom of these, two little silicone mats that you can use to help clean your brushes off um, in the water or whatever solution that you have in there. These, this is a feature that I've never used before. I've never used a silicone mat to, um, to clean brushes. And what's interesting is they've given us some advice here. So let's go ahead and take a look at that next. So the advice that they give on a couple of stickers on the side of the caddy here, uh, tips for taking care of your brushes, tips for cleaning paint residue on the silicone insert, tips for using a brush holder, and tips for oil painting. So tips for taking care of your brushes, you know, just your basic, your basic information. <laughs> Obviously, they don't want you just leaving the brushes soaking in whatever thinner or water that you're using. So that's some good advice there. It's this one that's kind of interesting to me with the, the silicone inserts. They're just saying, you know, with, with watercolor, water is enough. Just go ahead and, and run the brush along it. For acrylic, they recommend mild soapy water and clean. Obviously, you know what you use best for your particular acrylic paints. Um, and then for oil paints, please note that the silicone may deform when it's exposed to certain brands of strong acid dilutants. Uh, when it happens, please soak the silicone rubber in clean water for two to three hours and it will return to the original shape. Interesting. All right. And then it gives you some advice on how to use the brush holders and then tips for painting. So as I said, We've never actually used these things before, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how they work. So it says tear here. I. They don't bother me so much, but let's say someone out there doesn't want these things on the side of their, on the side of their caddy. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I am not gonna be tearing any more of that off without getting some goo gone going there. Okay, we're just gonna leave that. <laughs> that did not want to come off cleanly. How about this one? Maybe I took a 
razor blade to it, maybe. But yeah, those are those are kind of on there. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do any more with that until later. I believe what we have here now are the modular wet palettes and then paint storage trays. Let's just go ahead and push this up. And then undo these. That's kind of nice. And they're a little bit close together, but that's not too bad. Let's just set these aside. These look similar. Um, and I would suspect that these are indeed the wet palettes. All right, that's what that looks like to me. Uh, if the situation depicted in the diagram occurs, lid of box cannot be tightly closed. Please remove any items of excess height from the box. Well, that makes sense, right? All right. So this would be where the wet palette would then fit in. Let's go ahead and open one of these. Oh, it's already a little bit, little bit moist. Fits right in there, nice and snug. And you can go ahead and close that back up. You can put the other wet palette in here. One of the cool things about this is that these can actually snap together. So, you know, maybe on this one, maybe you use this as your wet palette and you can maybe put some tools over here or it looks like you're able to maybe clip um, one of the papers down and use it as another mixing station or pallet station. And it appears that if you wanted to, you could even, if you had brushes or maybe some tools that were small enough, you could fit those in there instead of using it as a second wet pallet. So that's kind of neat. And all those go back together. And then you can, let's see how easily these can be snapped apart without breaking them, right? That would be the key. Let's not, let's not break it. There it goes. Once you get used to it, I'm sure that's gonna be fairly, that'll be easier to do than just on the first time. Similar to the wet palettes, I think what we have here are a couple of watercolor painting boxes or painting grids. Yes. So if you aren't familiar with, with what these are, and let me just double check and see if this other one is the same. It is. So if you aren't familiar with what these are, you can squeeze um, acrylics into these or um, you know tube watercolors or those sorts of things. And then similar to like with the wet palette, you can put those into this, these spaces. And then as you can see, there's this grid here that allows the, uh, the lid to really lock down solidly on the, uh, on the tray beneath. And what it'll do is it'll help keep those colors workable for not indefinitely, but for uh, you know a while, so that if you're working on a project, you can walk away for the day, come back and open this back up, and then continue your work. Unlike the ones that I have at home, and I'll show you one in a moment from my house, mine don't have this little uh, flange, tongue, finger. Um, I suppose, yeah, you could, you know, you put your color down in there and instead of, once you dip, instead of doing it off, you know, cleaning your brush off to the side of your tray, you can use the, you can use that little flange thing instead. That's, that's kind of neat. Maybe help on uh, uh, keeping down your mess. Aaron also points out that that would, by having that little tongue there, that would help prevent paint from, occluding, a favorite word of ours, from interfering with the lid as the lid comes down and seals off that tray. 
I just wanted to bring in three of the paint palettes and storage devices that I have at my workbench currently. Um, this is one of my uh, wet palettes, an army painter one. I've got this little palette that I used for mixing acrylic paints in. And then I have this one, which is actually new, and I haven't broken it out and used it yet, but I just wanted to show you because it is very similar to the other storage, paint storage tray that's in the modular art box. The reason I wanted to bring this in was just to show you that a couple of things. This opens up. It's got a very nice, thick um, silicone top to it to make a really good seal. And then there's this really neat feature there which allows that to sit up and then you can just go ahead and it just makes it more accessible for painting, which is, I thought, really cool. Um, not that this uh, could be replicated necessarily with the art box as it is now, but it is a neat, it is a neat little feature. What I do like about the Crydrufi modular art box though, is that it is, of course, modular. While it isn't the same size as, say, this wet palette, so that this wet palette paper could be used here, it does have a wet palette in there. It does have an option for a dry palette and then a couple of those other paint trays. That's nice, especially if you're traveling. If you're going on a trip or if you just wanna, I don't know, you wanna paint outside or if you're gonna go to a local club meet and you wanna do some work there, this would make that a lot easier to do. Less things to have to pick up. However, I will say that one of the first things that I did when I got this was I tried desperately to fit to fit this palette in there because I'm like, oh man, that would be great if I could fit this and it just doesn't quite make it in there. And then Aaron told me, well, you know, no matter how much you try to slide it around and squeeze it in there, it's not gonna fit, but you could take a Dremel tool to it and <laughs> okay, well, that'd be cool. But again, this is my favorite palette, so this is what I would, I would look for in something like that. But this, again, could be used as a dry palette um, if you put the paper on top uh, in conjunction with the wet palette underneath, and that would be cool. Um, for me, I probably don't need two of, of these, these guys here, so I would probably look for, you know, not having that, that bottom one coming along with me anywhere. Now with regards to that, I believe, and I will double check, but I believe that Crydrufi has sent us like the Uber version of this art box and that there are some versions that either come with just two or three of these modules the, to fit underneath the, underneath the caddy. The box says that these, these little holders are set up to accommodate a number of different, of different paintbrush shapes and sizes. As we were going through it, I went and I grabbed uh, a few of my uh, different size paintbrushes just to see how well they accommodate them. Now, of course, these smaller ones here, these smaller handled paintbrushes I'm using on the tray, that works, that works pretty well for that little one. Um, this AK Interactive number six flat head here, flat brush, it doesn't really fit like where they would say that something with a larger handle would fit. And it does kind of okay there, I'm all, I'm all right with it. It's, it's fairly secure, it doesn't seem like it's gonna fall off. If you push it down a little much, it starts, the rubber starts to squeeze and looks like it might come out, but I think if you keep it up a bit like that, that's cool. Where I really felt that it didn't necessarily work as well as maybe it could is with this uh, Flexifile type brush handle. Um, they're pretty wide down here and they aren't uncommon. That's the other thing. They are not an uncommon paintbrush at all. They don't necessarily fit into these wider spaces and trying to use them in, I mean, I guess like that, then it's sticking up pretty high. Um, going down to 
down further along that and then it starts to sort of squeeze out and it doesn't hold it necessarily as well. Um, I think the, the thing to keep in mind with these holders is that it would take some experimentation to know which brushes uh, work best in them and how they work uh, in them. Now, the one thing that I really do like about this is that I've never had one of those one of those capabilities to have the brush hanging and then dry over a uh, over a tray, you know, upside down. For me, however, if I'm on the go with this, I could see where the the way that this setup is how that would be useful. At my workbench, I could really see that this itself would be useful. I'm not so sure though, again, other than maybe using, using one of these drip trays to have uh, brushes dry, I'm not so sure how useful it is to me. Otherwise, because the way that I work, I need these brushes up and out of the way. And the way that they, they sit out here, I'd be afraid that I would clip them at some point or constantly being, uh, you know, knocking them off or just be in the way. Even if, even if it was out like this, just the way that I'm working at a workbench usually, I'm not so sure that having my brushes that immediate to me would be, uh, would be that useful. However, like I say, I really do like this setup in particular with the cups. You could even use it um, if you didn't use the, the brushes, these the brush holders. You could even use it to for your for your water, and then you might put tools over here. I mean, heck, you can put some brushes in there if you want. You could replace a mug. I'm joking. Anyway, so I do think that the Crydrufi modular art box is pretty neat. I would not mind having it at my workbench and the longer I had it, the more I would figure out how to use it. Um, one of the things that we were talking about is that it would be nice to have a better way to store brushes rather than just having them stick up, especially if you're going to use this on the go. Um, you know, if you, keep your, if you keep your brushes in a separate box already and you retain the little, the little uh, protective sleeves for the top and that sort of stuff, then you're already taken care of. If you don't though, then you're kind of left uh, up to your own devices. The art box, there's not really, you're not gonna be doing any airbrushing with this really. Um, and so it probably is most limited for us to either working on figs with it or doing your, you know, finishing brush painting sort of activities on your other models, no matter what they are. However, I, like I say, I do think it's cool and I'm really, I'm really glad that Kroidrupi has come out with this and I think there's a place for it among scale modelers. If you like what you see here and want more, subscribe to Fine Scale Modeler Magazine. You'll get six issues a year crammed with how-to stories from some of the best modelers around the world. Go to finescale.com slash YouTube for a special offer for YouTube viewers like you. For the longest time, and you know, pretty intensely most recently, we will hear questions. We will receive questions. Um, from readers, you know, why is Company X making another model of this particular thing? Um, I think a good example right now of the, in the current zeitgeist is why, why is, is Edward doing 172nd scale Mustangs? They're coming out with a whole family of 172nd scale Mustangs. Why? God, yes. Do we not have enough, you know, 172nd scale Mustangs? Another Mustang yawn. yawn. Yes. So we thought we would kind of broach that subject a little bit. And I, the first thing that I want to point out is that these companies are businesses. They are not vanity projects. They are there to make money. 
Because what we will hear is, why don't they do some wacky, off-the-wall, rare subject instead of doing this other thing? And these companies, they know what the market is willing to bear. Right. And Edward knows that it can come out with 172nd scale Mustangs, and those 172nd scale Mustangs are going to sell. Exactly, because it's Edward. We know they do a good job. They did a good job on the 48 scale ones, which they sold a bunch of, and people complained about, oh, another Mustang when that happened. They're going to sell, and that allows Edward to do what you would might consider more vanity type projects, which they have a history of doing, whether it's Czech Zlin trainers or the B-534 biplane fighter from the 30s. They will do those off the wall subjects that they know there's a smaller market for, but they can bankroll that by selling these kits that are going to be popular with a lot of modelers. Right. I mean, I like the Mustang just fine. It wouldn't be the thing I would build a thousand of. But it's a pretty airplane, and there's lots of pretty markings, so it's going to be a popular subject, and always has been a popular subject. And as in a, in a conversation that we've had, you've pointed out that the 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 modeling industry, like like you said, is littered littered with the corpses of defunct now defunct companies, and that's what they were doing. That's they right. were concentrating on these really narrowly defined, off the wall, rare subjects. And the thing is, is that while that might be your, your ideal model is this really rare subject, and my God, you really want somebody to do a really good version of it. Thing is, is that that's niche, and niche doesn't bring in the big bucks. Right. You may be the only person, or one of ten people in the world, who wants a Aracuda, as an example, like okay. of which Bell built five. I don't remember. It's a fairly rare, rare, rare plane. Sure, it didn't really yeah. see active service. It's cool looking, mm -hmm. but it's not going to sell a lot, as opposed to P fifty one Mustangs, of which they built ten thousand of and served for fifty years. Right. So. Right. So I think there's another aspect to this too, and that is, again, they know that it's going to sell. And I, you know, I don't think there's, we don't have, we don't have data on this, but how many of the, how many of the people out there do you think that are complaining that there are these, you know, we're, we're, we're harping on the 172nd scale. Mustang. So we'll just keep we'll keep going with it because we've been using it. But I mean, it, you could you could sub in any number of other other model kits from any number of other companies. But the you know how many people are complaining? But then they're going to turn around, and then they're going to go buy six of that. Sure. And when I <laughs> that to me is particularly galling because it's like okay if you're going to complain about it then don't go buy it. But if you're going to complain about it, and then you're going to go to the IPMS Nats, and you're going to be in line, and you're going to be one of the guys or gals who goes walking away with a bunch of these kits, then you are then just perpetuating what it is that you're railing against. I'm not, I mean, at that point, I think it's time to right. be a little quiet about it, right? I mean, everybody likes to be heard, but if you're just complaining to complain or to be part of the, the current complaining zeitgeist, then I think, as my wife says, Girl, put yourself together. We're going to that well again, <laughs> twice in the same episode. Twice wow. in the same <laughs> No, I, it's just, it's one of those things. There, It's business. Right. It comes down to business. And if, if those 172nd scale Mustangs or whatever the model is, wasn't going to sell, then they wouldn't do it, and they would do something else that did, and probably spark the same sort of, you know, complaints or or eye rolls or whatever. Right. But the thing is, is that they've got to sell those to be able to do the rarer, more unique, and perhaps more exciting models. Right. I mean, they're the most of the model companies that we deal with have the same theory. They'll do the big things, and then they'll do something that's a little normal. Tacom, for example. New Tigers coming out, new 35th scale Tigers. Everyone's going to go, yay, another Tiger. 
But Tacom's also the company that just recently gave us the first M29 Weasel family kits that we've seen in 50 years. Right. In plastic. So, you know, they're, they're kind of covering their bases too with different, going to different subject matter. So let us know what you think. What do you think about companies that are, you know, basically going back to the Back to the well, as you like to say. Back to the the safe, the same old, same old. Um, how do you feel about it? Let us know in the comments below, or you can email us at editor at finescale.com. Thank you so much for watching. Indeed, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. So she's gonna say it's a great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great episode. It's a great episode. But first. First, we've got some new great kits for you. <laughs> it may not be very big or have many pieces, but it's got a lot of good detail for this case. <laughs> it's all right, it's fine, you know, you'll have fun building it, maybe. These kits are well timed. <laughs> oh no! Are you okay? Front, Front side, side. We are well. <laughs> Badgins. You gotta get me some of those badgins. Do you like small German armor? Do you like small German armor? Well, now I'm being made a liar. Well, son of a kid. <laughs> the modular modules. In our opinion, in my opinion, our opinion, god dang it. Yawn. Yawn.